Welcome back, folks. This is the fourth part of my series on this Earth Games project. So, if you're just tuning in, I recommend you watch the first three parts first. This is going to be a somewhat shorter episode, as you might have noticed, because the additions I've made so far are mechanically similar to previous additions that I've already explained. So for this video, I'll be focusing on the design aspect of project management by explaining my design choices. As I was coming closer to the point at which I would need to start designing the user interface and introducing game mechanics, I realized I needed to wrap things up aesthetically with respect to the globe. The globe had all the structure I needed to build a game around, but it still didn't seem enough. And some of the more recent changes I've made tie into this desire to polish the aesthetics. In the last part, I added perpetual rotation around the axis, which made it seem more like a planet floating in space. I suppose the industry name for this aspect of design is immersion. I want to make the player feel like they're playing around in a real world, and that this world feels tied into a greater universe. Some examples of games that immerse the player in the world are Sid Meier's Civilizations 5 and 6. There are some small, unrealistic aspects of these games. For instance, units that are as big as the buildings of cities. But it's the combination of lots of small details and the imagination of the player that drives home this feeling of immersion. The house on the plantation, the city nestled between two hills, the river cutting through the land, this is all I need to imagine this as a real world with real history behind it. In my opinion, photorealism has very little to do with immersion, although I suppose it can help if you have the resources to build realistic looking textures and game worlds. Just the existence of these small details, no matter how low quality they are, can open up the imagination of the player. So, I found three more data sources to add immersive aesthetic details. They're not necessarily functional, but they help complete the game's look. Right off the bat, you might notice the stars, which help set the globe in space. I use the HYG database, which includes the coordinates, apparent magnitude, and color index of about 60,000 stars. To generate these. You also probably notice the Sun, which from our perspective rotates around the Earth at an angle from the axis. This gives the impression that the globe is tilted, as it is in real life. The Sun casts a shadow on half the Earth, giving the impression of a day and night. You might notice that the night is shorter and longer in some places. To add to this feeling of day and night, I got data on population, and used this assumption that regions with higher populations will appear to have brighter city lights visible from space on the dark side than other regions. This is actually a little practical, in that I may want to use this data later for some game mechanics. Finally, I found data on types of land cover. Each pixel on the globe is one of beach, grassland, forest, or a few other types of land cover. This is better than the bands of color I had before, but it's still not great looking. But I think I'm going to have to live with this, as I might be running up against the limitations of a globe made of only 10,000 pixels. That's about all I have to show for now. I think it's great progress and I might finally be moving on to UI and actual game mechanics. If you're wondering about the math behind shading the globe, I'll explain briefly. We're given two vectors. One vector for the sun's position, and one vector for the position of some arbitrary pixel on the globe. There's two positions for these two vectors to be in relative to each other. There could be an angle less than 90 degrees between them, or there could be an angle greater
greater than 90 degrees between them. It should be obvious that whenever the angle is greater than 90 degrees, we should count this pixel as being on the dark side of the globe. So we can calculate the angle between these two vectors by this simple formula. The cosine of the angle equals the dot product of the two vectors over the product of their magnitudes. So to determine if an arbitrary pixel on the globe is on the dark side of the globe, we simply plug the position vector of that pixel into this equation along with the position vector of the sun and solve for the angle. And if the angle is greater than 90 degrees, then it's on the dark side.